I wanted to thank you, Jim, and thank you, Hopkins Center for the Arts, for hosting this exhibit, Contemporary Realism, Artist from the Atelier. Our reason for the exhibit is to introduce our artists and teachers who have been trained at the Atelier and are pursuing successful careers as contemporary realists. We also want to make the general public aware of our teaching program that trains artists for this profession as a classical realistic painter, and that we also have part-time classes that are open to the public. I would like to take a moment to give you a brief history of the atelier. Atelier is a French word which means studio. Our program is called the Atelier Studio Program of Fine Arts, and we have been in existence in, in Minneapolis for over 50 years. The mission of the atelier is to train artistic individuals to see and render what they see using the classical and traditional methods from the past. Most artists agree that when they first attempted to draw what they saw in front of them, that though they might have been thrilled and excited to express themselves, they soon wanted or craved better skills to produce what they had in mind. This training has been sought out by artists for, from across the United States and around the world. I myself moved from Texas at the age of 21 to study with Richard Lack, who was the founder of Atelier Lack, which he opened in 1970. Richard Lack was an exceptional artist and teacher and is recognized around the world for his work not only as a classical painter, but as a great teacher and for passing on these classical methods of training that were almost lost. Our particular lineage is unique in that we are not only teaching the French academic lineage, and methods of drawing, but also the impressionist methods of seeing color. The Atelier is the flagship school for training artists in these methods. From the early 1920s, it became more difficult to find teachers who were qualified to teach these methods, and even in the 1950s when Richard searched for a teacher, it was near impossible. And it was only by chance that he discovered his teacher, R.H. Ives Gamble, when he, is a, when he was copying an artwork on his pilgrimage to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Gamble trained around 30 students from 1930 to 1980. Lack studied or apprenticed with Gamble and learned to see and render using both academic and impressionistic methods. Gamble was convinced, and rightly so, that if he did not train artists in these methods, that this tradition of classical picture making would be lost. And I can testify that as a student searching for a teacher in the 1970s, it was near impossible, and again, it was word of mouth, and being in the right place at the right time, that I was lucky enough to hear about and find my teacher. This story was similar for all my fellow students who attended Atelier Lack. At that time, students like myself felt very fortunate when we, were found, when we found our teacher, and because it was so hard to find the training, many of Lack's students have also taught to help keep the tradition alive. I also went to, want to mention Dale Redpath and Lynn Maidrich, who are featured in the show. Dale is an incredibly talented artist who I have had the privilege of co-directing with at the Atelier from 1992 to 2017. Her and I both studied with Richard Lack for five years each and then taught with him at Atelier Lack for another nine years before he retired in 1992. After a stroke in 2017, Dale retired, but her support for the arts and the Atelier is still strong. Lynn Madrid studied at the Atelier from 1995 to 1999 and then taught in our full-time program for a few years as she launched her painting career as an equine artist. Her love of animals and horses show in her exquisite paintings. Lynn continued to teach part-time classes at the Atelier until last year when we closed due to COVID. Lynn passed away last September and she is greatly missed. More of our work can be seen at the Atelier as part of our permanent collection and along, along with Dale Redpath, Richard Lack, and Ives Gamble. Richard Lack and these painters hold a special role in the Atelier's legacy as carriers of the tradition by teaching and in their beautiful drawings and paintings. On a personal note, I love people and painting, so it was a natural fit that I gravitated to painting portraits for my livelihood. I have been fortunate to have painted over 150 commission portraits for presidentials, port from pre presidential portraits to debutantes, family portraits, CEOs of corporations, and official portraits of judges, both locally and on a national level. I continue to serve as the director of the atelier and head instructor and love working with our teachers and students. 
by the way, all of our teachers, as you have heard, are ITA trained, and I'm very privileged to work in the exhibit beside this talented group of award-winning artists. Our artists here are living proof that this training still exists and that and they are the reason our program has continued as a model for many of the ateliers that continue to crop up around the country and the globe. So, Laura, as, as you introduced them, I'll just say a few words too. Laura Tundell is the assistant director at the atelier, and her master, and she's a master painter whose incredibly beautiful work is an inspiration to all of us. And I'm, I'm hoping all of you have seen this show out there, but. Uh, she, her work is incredible. Uh, Christine Mitsu, full-time instructor. Uh, she specializes in imaginative painting and illustration. She has helped propel the atelier training into the 21st century through her masterful application of not only traditional methods, but also through the use of digital illustration. Andy Sojean, he is not here with us tonight, but he's a full-time instructor, instructor, and his love is figurative work and contemporary designs. Andy's work continues to thrill us as he explores the beauty he sees in the world around him. And Kenny Schweiger, full-time instructor, who through his love of color and, his, and its uses and his interesting subject matter creates intricate work that brings us great joy to see. And Brenda Ward, an accomplished artist whose work is a shining example of what taking classes at the atelier and our part-time program can result in. Brenda is also our promoter for exhibit venues. So with that, I will turn the mic over to either Laura or to you for questions. And yeah, well, we can certainly start with Laura. Um, um, yeah. I'll just talk a little bit about the atelier in general and just what our uh, curriculum is there. Um, so we, our, our curriculum is we have a four-year program, but a lot of, of our students stay for uh, optional fifth year to do work on larger imaginative pieces. Um, usually our first year is just straight boot camp, it's back to basics, um, charcoal with casts, figure work. Um, everyone in our school does figure work every single day for three hours a day, um, so it's quite rigorous training. Um, first year students are also working in casts in the afternoon, um, and they stay in black and white the entire year. Their second year then, they move on to still lifes, and they set up, uh, which is good uh, introduction to color work. Um, so that we have them, you know, you can see a little bit more originality through each student than with how they set up their still lifes. Uh, once they get a few still lifes, you know, three, four still lifes that they've completed, then they move on to working um, from live models, still portrait models. And then we usually have them do about four or five portrait head and shoulders before we have them move to a larger portrait uh, with including hands or three quarter length portrait. Um, then the goal from there is to move into more interior. I don't know if we really have, do you have an interior in the show? I'm trying to think if we do. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the next thing then from larger portraits would be moving into um, interior settings, like usually a person in a room setting so that students can kind of um, get used to painting the depth uh, of space perspective with also a person included. And then usually fifth year, we have people do either more imaginative work, larger uh, interiors, and in some cases like Christine does more imaginative work and we all kind of do our own. And with this kind of training, I think we can each choose then what avenue that we go into for what we'd like to do for our, excuse me, like to do for our chosen career path, so. I, well, I have a question uh, in that the, um, the umbrella terminology that, that you use for um, the aesthetic and philosophical drive uh, for the school is classical realism, uh, which I think the, the person off the street might make the assumption that this is reflections of real life. And to see Christine's work in this show, um, 
that's a diff that's a different real life than I'm accustomed to, and uh, and there's the fantastical, the the water elemental, and and the dragon. So, um, can you speak, Christine, to um, your approach to um, art making, and how classical realism um, applies to the the fantastical? Sure, Jim. Yeah. So. Um with this particular training, like Laura mentioned and Sid mentioned, we, we get trained to see and observe the world around us. Um, so the things that I pull from for my fantasy pieces, I'm looking at the color of something in sunshine, the color of a leaf um, backlit, the color of the leaf in shadow, the color of a leaf on a gray day. You know, it's all different. Um, I'm looking at the well, atmospheric perspective, right? How things get bluer or take on the color of the atmosphere as it goes into space. I'm looking at um, edges and relationships of um, things that are maybe in focus, similar to photography, I guess, or even like as we're talking here, you know, you're in focus, I'm in focus for you, everybody else is kind of fuzzy. Um, so that's kind of like a broad idea for how we treat edges. Um, but all of that I throw into my uh, fantasy stuff. And when I interviewed for the program, I told Sid and Dale that I, I really wanted to make the stuff in my head look real. Mm. And they're like, okay, <laughs> totally accepting, come on in. Um, and that I think has been the, the biggest takeaway for me for just having, that, having the tools to mesh just you know the nebulous thoughts that we all have of whatever <laughs> into something a little bit slightly more tangible. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, and you essentially answered uh, a follow-up question I had, but um, maybe you could expand on it a little bit. You knew going into the program that you were looking to create um, a more realistic looking vision of the, the things that you had growing from your imagination. Yeah. Have you always been attracted to that type of uh, expression, uh, making uh, fantastical creatures or? Um, off and on. I mean, I, I guess, I think like a lot of us, you know, we were maybe first expressing ourselves with the crayons. And, yeah. You know, um, did that maybe a little better than speaking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think throughout my life growing up, you know, it, it was, um, a lot of fantasy stuff or like my folks took us to the um, various museums around town and so you know I was also attracted to a lot of the um, uh, eastern art the the silk paintings the the delicate atmospheric landscapes um, the the Smithsonian magazine Hieronymus Bosch mm -hmm. and his wild visions of the Garden of Earthly Delights um, mm -hmm. just wow <laughs> If you don't know what that is, look it up. It's insane. Um, and yeah, I, I think just kind of off and on played with it. Um, when I was in high school, I think that's when it really started to click a little bit more. Um, some of my friends introduced me to Dungeons and Dragons yeah. <laughs> and various fantasy books. And, that, and it wasn't like a huge dive into that, but it was just kind of something interesting. And then college, that kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit, and um, I ended up going into graphic design and eventually came back around to this. Mm -hmm. um, and what really opened my eyes of the type of training that I needed was I went to a convention with some fantasy pieces that I did, and um, one of the practices is that some of the art directors from the, the game companies will be there so you can have a portfolio review. Mm -hmm. And the person very kindly looked through my pieces and gently suggested that I go look at some of the artists' work that they were working with at the time. Sure. And my eyes were like, just, I don't know, the size of saucer plates probably, because it was just amazing stuff. And I saw the difference of how um, anatomy and color choices and composition and all that stuff that now I have words for it, but at the time I was like, whoa, okay, my stuff looks like a kid did it compared to who they're working with. I need help. <laughs> sure, sure. So, yeah. Um, 
Excuse me, just a second. Did you adjust the uh, levels a little? Because we're getting some feedback. Thanks. Um, do in the the rest of the work on display from this group? Um, uh, uh, I don't think any of the other work um, has that same fantastical element. Uh, we've got still lifes and and portraits, but do any of the other artists here, do you also engage in some of the fantastical at all? Yeah. Um, yeah, a little bit. I have the little hand with the flame yes. coming out of it. That's yes. a little bit. And I'm working on a nursery rhyme series. I just did one called Sixpence Pie. So got blackbirds coming out of a pie and, and yeah. things like that. So, yes. Actually, could I add to, yeah. um, the... the uh, which one was it? The, the the desert piece that Lynn did with the dog in the tent. That's yeah. that could be considered imaginative as well. Yeah, that doesn't for exist. sure. So yeah. she had to. I think she she took photo reference of uh, dogs from a dog show at an equine show, mm -hmm. um, and did a whole bunch of research. And I'm, I'm pretty sure she also set up some things in her backyard so she could have <laughs> stuff to work from life. For sure. Um, and knit, knowing how to knit all those things together mm -hmm. um, kind of falls in that camp too. Um, when you mention photo reference, how how much photo reference do you all use? Uh, do you try to avoid it, or um, we should touch on that? Is it a hot button topic? I think oh. for painters, yeah. Oh. For me, for me, it's essential just because um, since I'm also a commercial artist, mm -hmm. I have like pretty hot deadlines to work on, mm -hmm. and I can't. Um, one, I can't afford to hire a model to do that with the budget that I get, and two, um, two to four weeks to turn something around is real stressful. For sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we've, in, in our school, in the way we teach, everything pretty much is from life. Yeah. Um, uh, but we've realized that in the real world, you're going to be doing things like Sid does a lot of portraits and yep. uh, usually busy people that can't afford to sit for the 50 mm -hmm. hours or <laughs> whatever the, yeah. that a student might be able to yeah. uh, do when they're learning. So I, I think it's best for the, people, for the students to kind of learn how to do it from life first mm -hmm. and then take into account what photographs might not show you that you need to incorporate back in your work. Sure. Um, usually just because of, you know, if you have someone who's a really good photographer, like Dave, he can get some really good uh, photos for references for you to work from. But if people are using their cell phones, they have to understand that the compression of values pretty, you know, it usually eliminates a lot of the, the higher end range of values. So you mm -hmm. don't get those subtleties that you're going to in real life. So I think part of it is, is learning the traditional way so that when you have to work from photos, um, and you know, there's something nice about working from, from photos just because no one's moving. You can do, you can work on them whenever. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, at the same time, you have to understand what's missing with that, that, you know, to, to take uh, what you learned to put back into your painting. Did you want to say anything else? Sure. And a lot of times, uh, you may not have uh, one single photo that you're working from. Uh, it may be that uh, you pick a, a gesture or expression from uh, one uh, visual aid and use it with another background, but it's all you have to know lighting and you have to know perspective and, uh, and uh, you know, just uh, if a jet, and anatomy, of course, you know. So there's so many things that come into play uh, that if you're just copying a photo, uh, you, you can, we as artists can tell when that's happening because it's, you can see all the mistakes that happen with just, um, Sometimes it's a bad photo, or sometimes mm -hmm. it's the way the artist is reading the photo that they just didn't understand what was happening, or you know. Um, so it's it's I think it's just imperative to get training from uh, life, and that's why we have the figure model daily at school from uh, for three hours each day, and they do anatomy studies and overlays, and uh, so. Ideal, in an ideal world, we would love it if we could just work from nature. But uh, we're in the century we're in, and we have all these extra uh, resources. And our time commitment is totally different, too, our, the expectations that are put on 
on uh, us and uh, also on the individuals that we would want to sit. Mm -hmm. I can remember when I first started, and I only had, that was purist, I only had, they sat for the entire thing. And um, my uh, better half, Dave, at the time was just a next door neighbor, and he said, you're not ever going to be able to make a living like that. Nobody's going to come and sit, you know, 50 hours. And, you know, I said, well, I do have some sitting. So, you know, we had a lot of discussions and arguments about it. And I was like, and besides photography, it's, there's, it's not good. It doesn't show everything that I see in nature. It's like, well, you just don't have the right photographer. You don't have the good photographer. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I couldn't photograph my own work and get everything I need. I, I know some uh, uh, of you can. Uh, and it's just a lot of to take on an uh, extra understanding. So truly uh, working from life is, is, I think, what we all enjoy the most, uh, as well as I know, Christine, you, you have teaches gesture class. She's had to incorporate a lot of interesting, uh, extra things in our program uh, to help uh, in what she needs as an imaginative artist. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have, um, and when she went through school, she did all her overlays and anatomy studies, and uh, uh, we had perspective classes. So as we get different uh, individuals that come in wanting different goals, we say, okay, how can we help them get there? What can we do to get this understanding? Because basically this training is problem solving. We're, we're learning to problem solve through and navigate, and we're working on, each of us have our, our talents, and we also have our weaknesses, so we're trying to build our, our weaknesses uh, and finding ways to question and, and uh, uh, work through the process so that we get a, a good outcome for a, a beautiful painting. Um, Kenny, would you like to talk a little bit about what, you, what you've been doing? Uh, sure. as yeah, I, uh, I guess I, I came to the atelier training with a similar background or similar interest with Christine. Um, I was interested in comics, reading a lot of comics, playing a lot of games, and I thought that would be my future. Like, I want to make games. Um, but this really taught me to look at nature, to look at light, how that would fall across form, what sort of color intensities would reveal themselves. And that became very surprising. Um, I was much more surprised by reality than my own imagination. And so because of that, I think now more and more I have wanted to work from life and to try to understand this visual world that's around us. Um, uh, we're not just trying to copy the facts. I, I think that there is this poetic interpretation or these things that we're uh, trying to find that are truthful or that are beautiful. And um, I, I feel that kind of, it's kind of what uh, motivates us or are, those are like the seeds of a, a painting uh, or a, a potential idea. Um, as a part of the exhibition, um, we have a historical piece by Richard Lack, the founder of the school, that also has a sanguine study next to it, showing kind of the development of, of the composition. And Christine, you have a study drawing on display next to uh, a more finished work. Do you all work, um, when you begin a piece, do you work with preparatory drawings, or do any of you work directly in paint? I'd say without a doubt. Um, yeah. Like I, I brought uh, a couple of, of color sketches in for uh, uh, the painting that I did in this show. And uh, Sid and Laura always encouraged us to do studies. Uh, they're low-risk situations where we can problem solve. Um, we can do them quickly. Uh, and they kind of, they're visual ideas in a concrete form. And uh, then we can make the edits. Uh, you know, we can show them to other artists and get feedback. Uh, but they, uh, for me, that was a, a huge eye-opener. I, I would look at paintings in the museum and just thought, you know, like people stepped up to the canvas and painted them. But I didn't realize that a lot of preparatory work goes into uh, the paintings. And for... Um Maybe, Sid, uh, you could say if, if this was true of the philosophy of um, the instruction, um, or, or individual artists could, could um, answer this, but 
uh, or drawings ever used for any of you as an end in themselves, or is it always painting? So, Laura, you're nodding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I really like the medium of char of uh, not charcoal pencil, just okay. so graphite. So I've, occasionally I will just do just like a pencil drawing, pencil portrait, mm -hmm. which isn't really you know like a preparatory study yeah. um, for a larger painting. Um, so yeah, I mean that's just especially during the pandemic when you're stuck at home yeah. and stuff and got sick of doing watching TV for sure. countless hours, maybe just doing um, sketches too. That's another um, great way to just plan future paintings. So, I mean, that is, you know, mm -hmm. part of the preparatory work. But, uh, yes, I, I know. But in a less strategic yes. fashion. It's more global yeah. and you're just, you're keeping the hand and the eye moving. And, yep. Yeah. 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 Anyone else have want to weigh in on that? Not so much? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> I'm, I'm positive. Um, short answer, yes. Mm -hmm. I yeah. do. Um, for, for pretty much, yeah, for pretty much all, nearly all of my stuff I do preparatory. I usually start with teeny tiny little thumbnail sketches just to figure out what the heck, try to pin down the, those nebulous ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and then for, I think for a lot of us, it, you know, it moves from the black and white sketch to maybe a color study to figure out um, the, the scheme of the thing. Um, for me, that's a little, for me, that's very important, at least as far as composition for how it reads, because a lot of the stuff that I've done, um, at least for the commercial, uh, is getting reproduced at like an inch big. Mm -hmm. So it really needs to have punch. Mm -hmm. um, and then moving on to the uh, refined drawing, maybe getting reference. I work with Dave usually for that. Um, and then onto the final painting. Um, there are times though where I don't when I, and then it's more of just like an all prima kind of deal mm -hmm. where I, I've got something that I've been itching to paint, set it up, just go to town, have fun with slapping on thick, juicy paint. Totally. Yeah. Um, for, uh, there are a lot of painters here, I know, but not all painters, and some are even non-art art enthusiasts. Can you believe it? Uh, thank you for being here. Um, but could you explain what a la prima is? Oh, sure. Um, a la prima, um, I guess, generally means all at once, right? Yeah, all at once. Um, and it could be, so basically that means you're, you're pretty much painting the thing in like one session. So that could be a couple hours, it could be the whole day or whatever, but um, generally it's, as opposed to what we do um, for the training at the atelier, for the process there, it's an indirect painting method where we do a charcoal drawing where we're figuring out the composition, we're figuring out the values and all that kind of stuff to make sure that all works and then we'll transfer the drawing to canvas. And then as we paint, it's over several weeks um, where we're building up the paint layers, making sure the color and values are working together, working um, the, the nuances to get it to have that illusion of depth and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak about, um, and anyone could answer this, uh, but the transferring of your study drawing onto the canvas, um, how does that work? <laughs> uh, there's a couple of different ways to do it, uh, but the way that we teach our students is to um, take kind of like a clear transparency and outline the shapes, really thinking about the shapes from the drawing. Uh, with that clear transparency, we put that, overlay that on top of the canvas that we're going to paint onto and slide a sheet of graphite paper. Mm -hmm. um, and then using a, a pen, we go over those shapes. And that uh, kind of creates a graphite transfer. Um, so it's a, a blank canvas uh, with kind of the outline of the drawing transferred on top of it. And like a carbon. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we paint into that. Um, there's other ways, uh, gosh, the oil transfer. Um, you can make a photocopy of your drawing, put oil paint on the back of it, and then uh, just kind of directly uh, press that into your canvas. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, any other? In the gamel, uh, the study in the gamel uh, for the mural, 
there's a grid uh, overlay. You use that as well? Could you? Uh, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Okay. Oh, you can. Okay. Well, we don't generally teach the grid okay. method, but I know a lot of painters have used that mm -hmm. um, to to transfer to like if you have a you know a smaller drawing and you're transferring it to a larger mm -hmm. painting. So, but you would probably know more about the process. Do you know much about the process that? Well, basically, you're showing, uh, if you're working off of an inch or a half an inch, and you're going to blow up to say a foot, well, then it just you can kind of uh, just get your bearings with that grid. Mm -hmm. And the grid basically uh, is very similar to what we do with our eye training when we teach size size because mm -hmm. uh, they're learning to oh excuse me they're learning to see um, um, horizontals and verticals, and you kind of start to see what's lining up just in your eye. Uh, uh, so when we're teaching sight size, they start getting that, that method just automatic, automatically starts to happen. Uh, so uh, whether we realize it or not, we're kind of using a grid as well as um, diagonals and angles. And, and basically the first year is boot camp learning to see shapes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think most people uh, after our training can basically uh, enlarge your drawings without too much without having to be that precise, but uh, it's certainly what Gamble did for that, that painting that shows that method. And maybe for that one, it was uh, driven by the extreme scale change right. uh, being extreme. from a, a study to a mural. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do any of you work, um, well, uh, Christine, you mentioned uh, working in the computer. Um, so is, um, for, for others of you, do you work in mediums besides oil? I, uh, I feel like most, if not all, of the paintings on display are oils, are they? Um, do you work in any other painting mediums? Not currently. Not currently. Yeah. Uh, I, I sometimes revisit watercolor. That was my first love. OK. Um, and then a little bit of gouache and um, there's a picture I'm working on right now that I am um, using sepia ink, and then I'll, I think I'm gonna do some watercolor washes on that, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. Uh, from a material standpoint, a medium standpoint, is the emphasis on um, learning the specific qualities of oil paint at the school? Yeah, definitely. We we do have we do have uh, Cecile Hartlieb, who uh, has an excellent watercolor class. Mm -hmm. um, so she handles that for us. And then um, uh, in my illustration class, there are some folks that have a basic level of um, digital understanding. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they'll bring in their tablets or laptops or whatever, and I'll help them out a little bit when I can. But it, it's mainly focused on the the imaginative art process, not so much the um, digital painting process. I'd love, um, and hopefully I'm not the only one, but uh, where you find inspiration, each of you. Could you each speak to inspiration? Yeah, uh, for the painting, um, I definitely was looking at Dutch still life painting. Uh, and there was a show that came to the Minneapolis Institute of Arts that featured work by Vermeer and work by Rembrandt. And seeing those paintings was incredible. Uh, those artists handled the medium with such a range of expression to be able to express things like skin or like hair or fur or wood, all those textures uh, through the medium of paint. And so I, th I think part of the fun of painting is to be able to look at those historical pieces and then uh, kind of pursue expression of those textures. Brenda, how about you down there? Um, I dream <laughs> of my paintings. And so the, you know, the hours right before you wake up, that's where my inspiration is, mm -hmm. mostly. So. Um, other than that, I, I, I appreciate the classics. That's what it drew me to the atelier. 
I have a four-year BA in commercial art, and I was in commercial art for years, and I'm so thankful to have gone back and to learn from all these awesome teachers here. I've had them all. <laughs> um, and learn the classic way and to see better. I, it's, it's really worth your time. I'm, I was just a part-time student, but it was very beneficial. It just took me off about eight years ago. So, and I'm so thankful. So, um, yeah. Mine is much more boring. Um, <laughs> I'm a still life artist usually. That's what I, most of my paintings are, although I do like to do portraits, but sometimes just walking through like a thrift store or a grocery store even, just kind of seeing what sort of colors are there and the, um, you know, some, especially in thrift stores, if there's something that's like really worn, that is really interesting to me. Um, like the, the one that I have out there, that's like the coat and mittens that was, one that I just saw in like a, a thrift store or something. And I just thought it'd be fun to kind of put that against like an old wooden wooden uh, door and uh, paint the different textures of the, the mittens and the coat and the, the wood, so, yeah. Well, for me, uh, doing commission work, I, I, uh, I get inspired by the people. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I'll look at them and, and uh, It'll, it'll trigger a response to um, an old master, and I'll think about having them hold poses that would work for that. Sometimes it's not their character, and so I have to break that. But uh, other times, uh, just uh, uh, the lighting, what, what, what the best lighting for them, and exploring uh, what colors will work best for their skin tones, and then just designing and telling a story about them, you know, adding things to the portrait that makes it more meaningful for them. Mm -hmm. And so I get inspired by the people I work with. And um, then I also do love storytelling. So uh, I, it's subtle in a portrait, but that's that there, it's, it should be there. You, you know, you want people when they're uh, looking at your painting to wonder, what is that person thinking? Or what's, what's going on there? Or they maybe, or maybe there's symbolism that that leads them to come back and check it out more. Um, generally, portraits, um, you know, you think, well, what's going to happen to that portrait after these people are gone? And only certain ones that maybe go into uh, uh, like the courthouses or in official places. Well, those, you know, okay, they'll be there a while. Mm -hmm. But some of the other things you do, well, what happens? Do they end up under a bed or in the closet or whatever? So in painting those portraits, you're looking to try to do something that inspires and makes people want to hang that, even though it's maybe they don't know who it is, you know? Uh, so um, I guess that's, I, I get inspired by the challenge of, uh, of how to bring life in those paintings. Everywhere and everything. <laughs> That's basically it. Um, I, you know, I, I thought about that, and it's just diff different things catch my attention. I, I we were at a uh, a sculpture park slash junkyard, Doctor Evermore's, over in Wisconsin, and there was this really cool rusted spiral staircase just out in the middle of the grass, going up to nowhere. And um, and I thought, ooh, what if, what if it went up and there was somebody that had, to, why would it go up there? Okay, well, maybe it's somebody that needs it. Okay, so who needs it? So, ooh, maybe a repairman has to go fix the stars. <laughs> so I, I, I just, I don't know, I guess I call it art soup, basically. Art soup. Art soup. Yeah. yeah. There's we all we all have these little pots boiling on the back burner of our brains and mm -hmm. all the stuff that all the stuff that I like, all the stuff that makes me laugh or makes me sad or whatever that I'm curious about, it goes into that pot and it bubbles away. Mm -hmm. And sometimes something bubbles up to the top and it's like, ooh, where'd that come from? Okay, let's go with it. See what happens. <laughs> Marvelous. Um your show is up through June 19th, um, but where else might we see work uh, from the students and instructors? Uh, this upcoming weekend in Northeast Minneapolis, uh, we are having a student show. 
It is open to the public. Please come. Um, there will be a, a great variety of different paintings, both figurative work, still life, and portraiture. Um, that is in Northeast off East Hennepin, um, kind of by 35W. Uh, we're in the Fisk building. Um, that's one location you can see some of our work. Where else? The Artists for the Atelier. Yeah. Artists for the Atelier will be showing our paintings uh, <laughs> there, uh, which will be in a gallery next to where the student show is at. Oh, the directions to get to, the, to get to it. The, yeah, it'll be in the same building. In the same building, and just in a. This weekend floor. as well. This weekend, this yeah. Weekend, yeah. So it's May twenty first. Yeah, May twenty May twenty first Friday is two to nine p.m. Saturday is twelve to eight p.m. and Sunday is twelve to five p.m. And can we find that information on the internet as yes. well? At the atelier dot org. Awesome. So. T H E A T E L I E R dot org. <laughs> this awesome. is it's French. No one knows how to, <laughs> no, one, no one knows how to spell it half the time. So Atlier. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you. Appreciate it.